Hello, welcome to the webinar today, The Essential Mobile Trends in 2015 that Impact Your Business. I'd like to start by giving you a quick overview of how we'll be spending our time. So the webinar is scheduled for about an hour. Uh, we'll just spend a moment on intros and housekeeping, and then the majority of time, probably 35, 40 minutes, will be Julie walking through some of the biggest trends and themes for the upcoming uh, year, so 2015, and then she'll dig into what it means for business. Uh, and, and how you need to be thinking about your own mobile apps. We'll spend just a few minutes discussing how to optimize your customer experiences, sort of practical tips, leveraging criticism and lean plum and where the two tools fit into some of the themes Julie's discussing. And then we'll close out with some question and answer. So as we're walking through the webinar during Julie's section, please feel free to submit questions into the chat pod. You'll notice WebEx has a, a little chat pod that you can uh, ask us any questions, so please do that. And at the end of the webinar, we'll take a look through the questions and um, pick some of those to have Julie answer. While we're going through the webinar, also feel free to engage with us. Uh, you can tweet using hashtag MobileBiz2015. So first of all, I'd like to welcome Julie Ask, the Principal Analyst at Forrester. We're very lucky to have Julie uh, with us today. She has a wealth of experience about, about mobile and mobile trends. Um, and we'll be going into depth in that in just a moment. But before we do, I'd like to give you just a, a quick welcome from both Criticism and Lean Plum. Uh, for those who haven't heard of Criticism or Lean Plum, let me give you just a 30-second snapshot of each company. So Criticism is the leading mobile application performance management company. We monitor over 30,000 apps and about a billion users across those apps. Criticism is a massively scalable platform that, that gives you a real-time view of key app performance diagnostics. And companies like Pinterest, LinkedIn, Yahoo leverage Criticism to deploy and develop better performing uh, apps that improve revenue, brand, and reduce their operational costs. Now, LeanPlum is the leading mobile-first solution for optimized app engagement. The company recently won Venture Beats Innovation Showdown, which recognizes the most promising startup in the marketing tech space. And we're also lucky to have with us uh, Peter Goldie. Peter is the CMO from, from LeanPlum, so welcome Peter, we really appreciate you joining us today. Hi, I'm excited to be here and uh, be working with you and Julie on this. Yes, fantastic. So Peter will be jumping in here and there through the webinar as we to add some color on uh, some of the components and uh, we welcome him. Okay, with that, that's all we wanted to say about Criticism Lean Plum for now. Uh, we'd like to hand it over to Julie. Thank you so much for joining us. We apologize about the, the hiccups and getting you up and running, Julie. <laughs> no, that's okay. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Uh, great, not to sound like a Verizon commercial, but I'm so relieved. Yes, I know. <laughs> so, All right, just uh, give me the cues for the next slides and we're ready to go. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just let you keep flipping through. Perfect. All right, and thank you for hosting me. Uh, so what we wanted to talk about today are some of the key mobile trends that we believe are having the most impact on businesses in 2015 and how that is changing consumer expectations of what their mobile interactions or experience is going to be look like. So on to the next slide. There you go. So the first thing is that new mobile-enabled business models are going to disrupt industries. And there's a lot going, you can just, yeah, flip the slides thing. So there's a few things that we're seeing in the market, and I'll walk through a couple of these and then give you a few examples. One of the first things that we see is that you can price based on actual performance and you can reward low-cost customers. One of the first examples that we've seen of that in the market is with a company called Progressive Insurance that puts a device onto your car and rather than rating you based on your age and your gender and your car type and where you live, they can rate you based on how you actually drive. And of course, those that are gonna sign up for that, that those are, that think they drive well, so to speak. Merck's a different example that I'll walk through in a little bit more detail in a minute. One of the second opportunities is using dynamic pricing models to maximize profits, and there's two examples, uh, both Amazon and Uber. 
uh, one of the things that we saw Amazon do a few years ago around the holiday season was to give customers a discount of 5% or a coupon, so to speak, um, based on um, what uh, they were scanning in a store. And if they could see that you were in a Best Buy, for example, they'd give you a discount if you were willing to walk out of the store and buy from them. And then, of course, Uber is constantly changing the pricing to match supply and demand. Number three, you can offer incentives to customers who are low cost to serve. Uh, the favorite example that I have here is with Virgin Pulse. They run a program with corporations that are self-insured that reward employees and give points or money back to those employees if they're willing to wear a pedometer, reach a step goal each day, record what they eat, and generally engage in, ha in healthy behaviors. <coughs> One of the fourth opportunities we see is about, and this is I think one of the biggest, but will be the slowest to come, is layering services onto products which creates new value. So many of us are buying connected products today from our car to our thermostat. August is a connected locks product to things like wearables, whether it's a Fitbit or a fuel band or a jawbone. Some of these simply come with mobile apps today, but a lot of them layer on value added services that help me out in the gym. So you can imagine an example, if your lock or your home door, for example, is Wi-Fi enabled or it's connected, so to speak, um, whether it's the UPS man that you trust or a child that has left a key at school and can't get into the home, right, you'd be willing to pay $5, 10 maybe even $50 to let somebody into the home so you didn't have to leave work or whatever you might be doing at the time. Uh, number five is in-app purchases in terms of selling services. Uh, there's a couple that I'll give you around Candy Crush, Candy Crush and Alive Core. But again, some of these are certainly things like uh, services layered on top of connected products like a Lark that offers coaching. If you've got some questions about uh, how well you're sleeping or how you could be sleeping better, some of these just serve us in a moment of need like Candy Crush when we really can't wait the next couple of minutes uh, before playing our next round. And then there's certainly things like stored value cards. Um, you may ask, well, what's new, to, new in a stored value card? And what's new with stored value cards is the timing. If you know that a customer is getting low, especially on something like telecom minutes or a data plan where I'm very, very dependent upon that, you might change pricing to get customers to buy sooner rather than later. So let's look at a couple of examples on the next slide. So the first example, and this is about performance-based pricing, is from a company, uh, well, everybody knows the company Merck, but based out of the UK, and this is one of my favorite examples. Uh, a few years ago, or more than a few years ago at this point, uh, Merck was not doing well in the UK or the European market with their human growth hormone treatment, and they came up with an idea to launch a product, an injection device, that uh, not only can time stamp and date stamp, but also location stamp and injection as well as measure the, uh, the temperature of the skin, the moisture of the skin, and the quality of the injection. And so a number of things happened when uh, Merck rolled out this product. First, they could coach people and get them and improve the compliance. Right? A lot of people didn't understand, well, why do I have to take the treatment every day, same day, same time after dinner? They could cut down on counterfeit drugs or misuse of the product, for example, if somebody were injecting their dog. And then finally, they could also measure the effectiveness of how well they were doing and to what extent folks were getting better. So as a result of being able to improve compliance and measure the effectiveness of their treatment program, they were actually able to prove that their product was better than that of their nearest competitor, and they were able to double prices while at the same time uh, quadrupling their market share. And what's fantastic about this, besides those of you who may be in the healthcare market and realize what a big problem compliance is, <clears throat> is the notion of, um, you know, when we reimburse patients. Uh, there's an idea in here and something that the UK government switched over to in this case is actually reimbursing patients based on compliance and not on when they actually pick up the drugs uh, at a pharmacy. So that's a big game changer. Uh, one more example on the next page that we have is with uh, Candy Crush and Alive Corp. If you just want to go ahead and build out the slides, Josh, thanks. Um, I, like I said, I use this example of Candy Crush a lot, and a lot of folks say, well, what does that mean to me? What does that mean to my business? I'm not selling games. But you have to look at the magic, the absolute magic of generating $1.5 billion in sales, 99 cents at a time, from less than 10% of your customer base that doesn't want to wait to get another turn. And you have to think about, well, what does that mean? How do we create an engagement model that's either so addictive or so compelling that customers can't wait and they're willing to pay us money to engage immediately. 
Uh, the second example on the right-hand side is from a company called AliveCore. Uh, they sell a heart monitor, essentially, that attaches to a mobile phone. They offer a free service of letting you know if you're doing, you know, well, okay, or not so well based on an EKG reading. And then if you decide, well, you know what, I'm a little bit concerned about that not so well, you can actually pay to have a cardiologist do a reading within the next 24 hours for simply $12. Um, and it's certainly been proven effective at detecting things like atrial fibrillation. And if you want to ask, well, what's new here? What's new here is selling healthcare for $12. If you want a technician to read it, it's $4.99. And who would have thought we'd be selling healthcare for $5 or $10 at a time? That's really game changing. So if we go on to the next slide and just think about what that means for a moment. Consumers are going to expect um, certainly more frequent updates to products and apps to fix problems or to improve customer experiences. You're no longer going to roll something out and be like, hey, I'm done. Whether it's a TV, a car, a thermostat, or even a mobile app, consumers expect that you're going to be using analytics, understanding what works and what doesn't work, and continuing to improve upon that experience. They're going to expect new features within connected products and apps and service delivery that takes into account uh, data that's shared and the trust that's built over time. If I trust you, I will share more data, but I expect you to use that in a way that offers utility back to me. All right. So the second big trend that we're looking at is consumers will spend more time on mobile phones, but in fewer apps. And let me talk about what that's going to mean for a moment. If we look at the model, and that's fine, Josh, if you want to build it up, if we look at the model that we have today, if you look at the left-hand side of this chart, consumers <coughs> have a lot of individual relationships one-to-one -one with apps. If you imagine that each of these orange dots is an app, a lot of us have downloaded 100, 150, or 200 different apps to our phone, and we have those relationships. But if we look at where things are headed, the first is that we do spend the majority of the time on our mobile phones when we're not talking within applications. What's changing, though, is where we spend that time. It's hard for us to maintain 200 individual relationships, and simply some apps some platforms offer more utility to us than others do. So if you look at this new model that I've got here on the right-hand side, the person is still in the middle. But rather than having 200 individual experiences that go around the outside of the circle, there's this other layer that emerges in the middle, and this is probably going to be 10 to 15 different platforms or categories where we choose to spend most of our time. So it's going to be maps like Google Maps, it could be Apple Wallet, or WeChat, or WhatsApp, Twitter, uh, certainly Facebook is very dominant today, and it's going to be about 10 or 15 different categories and you can call them apps, but they're a lot more like platforms than they are apps today, where your customers are going to spend the vast majority of their time. So if you have customers and you're a bank or you're an airline, some of you are still going to offer you service that's so unique to your customers that they're still going to download your app and engage with you. If you just think of United Airlines, for example, the only place I can get a mobile boarding pass is within United App, so I'm still going to download that app. But there's a lot of other things I'm going to look to do on third-party platforms because it's simply more convenient for me to do things while I'm in the moment. And so whether it's apps are going to sit on these third-party platforms, your content, your services, and we'll see what's next, but you have to start thinking about a plan to engage with your consumers where they are and not just act like a destination and expect that they're going to discover, find, and download your app and engage with you only there. So let's take a look at an example on the next page. Um, if I gave you the example of United Airlines, and we use this language at Forrester called moments, and the first example is what we call owning those mobile moments. So United Airlines owns those mobile moments where a customer has downloaded their app, and I open up that app to get things like a boarding pass, check a flight time, or rebook a flight. However, United Airlines also borrows mobile moments from others within their ecosystem or the travel ecosystem. This is a screenshot from TripIt where I can also see what my flight schedule is. And in the third category, United Airlines lends mobile moments to a partner, in this case, which is Uber, because they share a customer in this case. And this makes it a lot more uh, convenient for me to book Uber because I'm already in the United app, uh, perhaps when I land and I'm checking where the baggage claim is. So you need to have a strategy that goes beyond just owning your mobile moments, 
understanding where else your customers are so that you can borrow the right mobile moments and also lend them to the right partners. Let's look at the next slide, please. In terms of what uh, this means, if we just go back with, yep. Um, customers are still going to come to your app for those more complex tasks. What you have to expect, though, is the things that are easy may live outside of your own app experience today. So you need to think about how you're going to give access to services via widgets or micro apps within the flow of other mobile tasks or apps, whether it's booking a flight or making plans for dinner or finding a repair shop for a, repair shop for a bike. You just have to start thinking about where else should I be gauging my consumers and how. All right. So the third major trend that we see here is we call mobile moments. This notion of a mobile moment we define as, you know, the point in time and space when you or your consumer reaches for your phone to get something that you need immediately and in context. I believe that these mobile moments are going to shrink into what I call micro moments. So if we think about some of the interactions that we have today, a lot of them are overkill. Um, Mary Meeker did a study that showed that we each reach for our mobile phones 175 to 200 times a day, and about 75% of those moments are what we call glanceable moments. We're just taking a quick look to see, oh, is my child home from school? Is my package delivered? Is the money deposited? You know, how many steps have my dog walked today? It doesn't necessarily mean we're going to take action within an app. It's something we need to know or something that we need to know to take action in the physical world. And so one of the things that we talk about is right-sizing the mobile interactions that you have with your consumers. And so it could be a text message, like on the left-hand side here, that lets me know what gate my flight is departing from. It could be an audio signal. Uh, one of my favorite examples is from a company called WTSO, and it's the sound of two wine glasses clinking together when a sale starts, or it could even be a haptic signal uh, in my shoes. Once I've decided I want to go from point A to point B on foot, why do I have to stare at a phone in a blue dot moving around on a phone? Why can't I just get like a gentle vibration or a nudge that lets me know when I need to go left or right? If we think, so one of the things I would encourage you to know is, and I talk to our clients about, is think about micro moments now. Think about wearables later. There is no doubt that with phones getting larger, and interactions shrinking, we don't need a mobile phone, we don't need a mobile app for every engagement that we have. That said, I would not necessarily recommend that you go build a wearable strategy and build apps, but you do need to think about how these micro moments and how these right size mobile engagements play out on devices that extend beyond the phone. One of the things that we know, just to wrap this up from our side, is that consumers don't want to pull their phones out for simple interactions. Among online consumers that we have surveyed, 40% are tired of pulling their mobile phones out of their pockets or purses to see what just happened. So in terms of this uh, user experience whim, consumers are going to expect right-sized experiences. No more or no less than they need to get a job done. <coughs> And they're going to expect this information or a signal to appear just when they need it to take action. And this is where you begin to think about the role that analytics plays here. If you can't get customers to download an app, if you can't get them to share information, if you can't observe them, and you can't build trust with them such that they share more data, you're not going to be able to build the insights that you need to build through analytics to begin to anticipate what it is that your customers need next and to start thinking about how to serve them proactively rather than having everything be pool-based. And you're going to have to think about, well, how do I do that without being creepy? How do I do that with being helpful? The fourth trend that we see is that business and technology strategies will shift from what we call apps to experiences. Um, a lot of the attention, yeah, the next slide is fine. Um, a lot of the attention in the past few years has really been on apps. And as we look forward, there's a few things that are going to happen. Apps will still be very important, especially for, like I said, the airlines or banks that really can act as a destination. We talked a little bit about the notion of what we call platform-based experiences, where your customers are going to be on a number of different platforms like Facebook and WeChat and Google Maps, and you have to think about, well, what, your, what is my interaction strategy there? The third category is what we call embedded experiences. At the end of the day, consumers don't care a lot about technology. They care a lot about, like, service utility, and what you're offering to them. 
So if we go to the next slide, one of the embedded experiences that folks think a lot about today, well, I mean, first, okay, so today is very app-centric, right? We've talked a lot about that, right? Where I've got a map, I've got TripIt, I've got Yelp, whatever it may be, it's a very siloed experience. Look at the next slide. Um, you know, we talked about this notion that your brand is not a destination, and you have to think about your strategy on Facebook, WeChat, and Google. And then finally, what we're talking about here is this notion of embedded experiences where high definition context is the future. So this isn't necessarily an app that I download. Today, the best example of this is something called Google Now that essentially learns about my behaviors and habits, like when do I typically get up? Do I commute to work? Do I ride a bus? Do I drive in a car? What time do I need to go? It has access to my calendar to know when my day starts. And by ingesting all of this contextual information, it begins to engage with me in a different way by pushing out a text message, it could be an audio notification, it could be resetting my alarm clock, but it's a type of Uber experience uh, that's going to depend very, very heavily on context and the insights that you develop from analytics as we look forward. And this will be one of the things that really differentiates mobile experiences going forward. So if we think about what this means from a user experience standpoint, you can't just think about technology. You know, what's in an app or an experience or an interactive push notification, right? Consumers simply want to get stuff done and they want to get stuff done simply. When consumers are on mobile devices, they become very, very task-oriented. Today, a lot of this interaction is pool-based, but they're going to expect you to start to anticipate what it is that they need in that exact mobile moment and to proactively do that. And so if we think about proactive notifications, more push than pool, you can do this if your customers trust you enough to share data with you and you're smart about how you use that data. So the fifth trend that we see is that data will be a source of competitive advantage. Um, and you can probably see that we've been leading up to this by talking about mobile moments, context, and anticipating exactly what it is that your customer needs in that mobile moment. So if we think about the landscape for data uh, today, you know, if we looked a few years ago, right, we call it yesterday, right, there's a lot that you could infer about products and service and customers based on limited information. Uh, data was scarce, <coughs> expensive, but it was easy to manage, it was neat, rich, structured, and it was a manageable number of formats and structures, and maybe you're still in this scenario today. But where we are today is we're starting to think differently, right? We will know our customers deeply or we're not going to have customers because customers have that expectation today. Inefficiency will mean depth. We will balance experience and quantitative analysis, and we're going to need to learn to navigate new risks like things like privacy and what's creepy. And as we look forward, <clears throat> excuse me, understanding the world based on a complete picture using all available information, data will be plentiful, cheap, but it's going to be really impossible to manage. It's going to be messy and detailed, and it's going to be nearly infinite in format and structure. And so having a plan for big data and how you're going to use data to create insights to anticipate what your customers need will be very important for you as you think about your strategy going forward. And if we think about some of the most important types of data when it comes to mobile, there's three categories. The first that surrounds the mobile moment is situation, right? So my location, time relative to an event uh, with wearable devices, we even have information about the body. The second big category is behaviors and preferences, so things that you learn by watching your consumers, observing their behavior within an app or online, or even things you glean by how they use Google Plus or Twitter or Facebook or Snapchat. And then finally, there's the emotions, what you can infer based on their logistics which most companies haven't done too much with so far. Uh, the new sources of data are going to continue to multiply. Uh, not all of these new sources of data will be relevant to your company, but whether it comes from a phone, an Alive Core, a fuel band, a connected watch, uh, from pills that you ingest that release information, uh, contact lenses, patches, uh, your home thermostat, there's your dishwasher. There are so many devices that are going to be connected uh, through apps. They're going to collect a lot of data, and whether they, the consumer will expect that you not only use this data to improve the experience, but if you start thinking about our ability to aggregate that data and use analytics to generate new insights, you begin to see what some of the new opportunities are. So in terms of what consumers will expect, uh, one of the first things is privacy, right? Uh, if I trust you and I share data with you so that you can offer a better experience to me, I'm not necessarily giving you permission to sell the data, 
but right, I want you to use it to offer utility and not push out targeted ads. And it's really going to be a generation. Uh, you're going to have the ability to generate unique insights based on combinations of data, and this will be a source of competitive advantage to you, and it will be one of the ways that you retain customers by serving them best in these mobile moments. And then finally, we talk about the relevancy of interactions to improve over time. Um, you know, certainly, you know, when most of us think about relevancy today, we think about location. Today, one in four consumers expect an experience to be relevant to them based on location, but how relevant that is, we expect to see that to improve over time and in ways that, uh, you know, we can't even imagine today. The sixth trend that we've outlined is the use of location to understand consumer movement within a physical space and how that will be a differentiator. One of the questions that I get a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot from our clients are, well, what about beacons? What are the best practices when it comes to the use of beacons? Um, and there's two things I come back to them and say. One, uh, beacons are too new. Proximity-based marketing is too new for there to be best practices. If you want to talk about best practices with location, you're going to have to get yourself a set of analytics, do some pilots, do some testing, and begin to develop those best practices yourself. The second thing that I tell them is, you don't have to necessarily depend on uh, technology such as GPS, proximity, or the network to offer you location. Do not, do not, do not, do not overlook the willingness of the consumer to provide their location or share their location with you very deliberately if there's something that you can offer to them in return. So one of the things I talk about is this layer of intelligence uh, that goes around location. Uh, I believe that location on its own is actually not very interesting. And what we need to think about is, well, what does the location mean? If you're a retailer, is a customer in your store, or are they in a competitor's store, or are they at home? If, it's a, um, if you're a bank, is your customer in their hometown, are they in the U.S., or are they global? because there's a lot of things that you can glean about the motivation or the needs of your consumers based on where they are. And you need to start thinking about how you create intelligence about the location. And it's not just about a lat long or I'm standing in the women's department and in Nordstrom's, but what is it about that location that I can use to begin to think about, well, what are their needs and motivations? So, we talk a little bit about indoor proximity marketing. Um, I'll read it. I put this down in writing so that everybody would catch it. Uh, there are no best practices really today. This is really new. Use of indoor proximity data is still in its infancy. Most installations can be best described as pilots. And these, developing these on-premises experiences will take a while to develop as enterprises test and learn slowly, right? You can't just put beacons in place. There's a lot of other steps that have to come into the mix. Your customers have to download your apps, and most of you know that very few of your customers have downloaded your apps. They have to have Bluetooth on. They have to agree to be tracked. Uh, there's a lot of factors that go into this, and then you have to pilot. You have to test. You have to test your hypotheses and your assumptions about what is their intent, what is their motivation, what is their need, based on everything that I know and where they may be standing in a store or a bank or an airport. And you're going to have to use analytics to learn, and you're going to have to go slowly so that you don't seem creepy and you create experiences that consumers are very comfortable with. Right, next slide, please. So in terms of what consumers will expect, um, again, mobile experiences are gonna change based on locations. One in four consumers already have this expectation today and they expect extreme relevancy and utility, right? Think big brother, big mother and not big brother. Uh, consumers will uninstall apps or worse, leave locations if a message has appeared to be creepy and you'll get exactly the opposite of what you intend. Right. These trends change consumer expectations and how they expect you to engage with them. So what has changed? Uh, today consumers expect immediacy, right? So they want to be notified now if something's on sale, my gate has changed, my flight has been canceled. The second thing that they expect is simplicity, right? They want to use a camera to image receipts and bills and checks. They want curated content. I talked about how consumers become very, very task-oriented on mobile phones. They expect simplicity. 
In fact, I think one of the worst ways that you can, unless you're selling advertising, one of the worst ways that you can measure your effectiveness is by time spent within your app. Uh, it's actually the opposite is what's best. Um, and certainly context, right? We talked about one in four consumers already expect experiences to be relevant based on location. They also expect things to be time sensitive and relative based on my past behavior. All in, this adds up to what consumers expect, and that's convenience and mobile. And this is what your mobile experiences need to deliver. Mobile is shifting customer expectations. Um, every one of you have had the experience of rolling out a new product or a service, and it has absolutely delighted your customers. And then over time, it becomes a very basic expectation that they have. But mobile is changing this experience in two ways. Um, it's first of all, it's, it's changing what's possible, and it's also accelerating the speed of the shift. And this is why you have to be in a process of starting small and iterating and using analytics to learn, fail fast, learn fast, and improve. If one of your competitors or even someone rolls out a feature that your customers expect you to have, your customers are going to expect you to roll out that new feature within the next six months. And that's why we talk about having agile processes and having a team in place such that you can roll out new releases of your app at least every two to three months because mobile is accelerating the speed of the shift and how fast consumers go from being delighted to it, have it being a basic expectation. So most companies, I would tell you today, lack the resources, talent, budget, solutions, and organization to create experiences to meet these shifted consumer expectations. Very few have that today. And as I like to say, you know, given what I've, you know, talked about here today, you know, for many of you, um, I do like to share my vacation photos. It may feel as though you're peering over uh, this vast canyon with no roads or no clear means of crossing it. Um, you're not alone if you think, wow, it's going to be really hard to meet these customer expectations today. Only 4% of companies or enterprises that we've surveyed actually have the resources and the organization and the budget in place to meet these shifted consumer expectations. So to meet these expectations of consumers, you've got to do a few things. One of the first things you need to do is deliver unprecedented simplicity within the user experience and just the right size of experience also, right? This isn't about everything under the sun. Mobile is really about knowing the needs and motivations of your customers on the go and delivering just what they need in those moments. You have to anticipate what your customers need based on context and proactively deliver it without seeming creepy, and you really need to shift your conversation from technology, right, apps, to service delivery, customer experience transformation, and new business models. So a few of the things that we recommend consumers do is one of them is to use this process that we call, or a framework, so to speak, that we call the IDEA. And it stands for Identify, Design, Engineer, and Analyze. You have to identify the mobile moments that your customers have in the associated context. Some companies will do this through ethnographic research, others will do this through journey mapping, but then you have to really look at once you have that journey map, where could the immediacy of mobile, where could the simplicity, and where can the context of mobile somehow improve or transform that customer experience? And then think about, well, what is the need of the consumer, the motivation of the consumer, who am I serving, and what is their context, so I can think about anticipating those mobile moments. You have to design the mobile engagement, right? And this is where we talk about right-sizing the engagement. It could be an app. It also could be an embedded experience. It could be an interactive push notification that ends up on an Apple Watch. But really think about, you know, what's the right kind of mobile engagement that's going to be effective? The third step is engineer, right? Engineer your platforms, your processes, and your people for mobile. This is where the heavy lifting happens in mobile. This is where 80 to 85% of your spend will be. Uh, lack of the resources to re-engineer organizations and platforms and processes is the number one inhibitor to companies moving forward with mobile. And it's, uh, you know, one of the things that's really beginning to separate what I would call the leaders from the middle of the pack, let alone the laggards. And then the fourth step is analyze results to monitor performance and optimize outcomes. Uh, we talk about starting small with, an ex in, with a platform and then extending. Do small things. Do simple things. Use analytics, develop insights, what's working, what's not working, what's getting the results that you want, uh, test your hypotheses, and then move forward and build and do this on an ongoing, engage, on an ongoing basis. 
Uh, the more real-time consumers are, it's the, they have expectations, you're going to anticipate their needs, give them what they need in the moment. You know, analytics aren't something that you do every couple of weeks or months through a report. It's something that you do on an ongoing basis to best serve your customers. I would tell you, think very, very carefully about metrics. Uh, things like app or site performance is core because switching costs are very low on mobile. Uh, less than half of those that we uh, survey uh, have a mobile analytics solution in place. Um, and so just over half of those that we've surveyed are actually flying blind. Um, and the inability of an app to perform, it seems sluggish, it breaks, there's 404 errors if you're using HTML5, whatever it may be, are one of the things that consumers will react to first, and it's so easy for them to go find and download another app. I talked about the fact that less than half of executives who we survey have an analytics solution in place, and if they do, a lot of times they're using the wrong metrics. Um, a lot of the analytics solutions that are in place today are very focused on engagement, length of engagement, uh, unique visitors, app opens, and things like that. Those may not be the best metrics for your business. If you're selling advertising, then time spent on your site, unique visitors, and reach, those are awesome metrics for your business. However, if what you're trying to do is serve your customers, then time spent may not be the best metric and opening your app may not be either, especially if it's something really simple that your customer wants to do, like know if a, a check has been deposited, you know, my dog has walked a half hour today, or my child is home from school. Uh, one of my favorite case studies that I've done is with a company called Life360, and they actually consider it to be a fail in some ways if their customer does open their app because they fail to anticipate what it is that their customer needs, which is to know where somebody in the family is. And then finally, use business metrics. Uh, they may not be the engagement metrics that you have in place today, but mobile isn't about a mobile strategy, mobile isn't a silo, it shouldn't be treated as a channel, it shouldn't be treated as a subset of a digital channel. Mobile is an enabler of your entire business, from new revenue to cost reduction to transforming customer experiences, and those are things that we measure with business metrics at the end of the day, and not simply just engagement metrics. So if we look at some of the common mistakes made today, I guess I've talked through a couple of these already in anticipation, but one of the first one is, is that the longer a customer spends in our app, the better. Only if you're monetizing content. Remember, consumers expect simplicity, which is fast. They expect things to be extremely streamlined. Um, app opens are good. App opens can be good, but only if a customer needs to do something complex or unexpected, right? We've talked about this shift from uh, pull to push, where you're looking to anticipate what your customer needs for simple information and push it out to them, you know, using the analytics that you have to really anticipate what it is that they need in those moments. Uh, I talked about your need to build your own best practices. Uh, mobile is still really new. The way that we want to use mobile is still very new. So there are very few really good best practices out there today. We can talk about process best practices, but for you and your business, you're probably going to have to develop a lot of those best practices on your own by using things like the idea cycle, starting small, iterating, and using analytics to really understand what's working and what's not working and making shifts based on that. Uh, based on the learnings that you do have, you know, document your best practices and share them internally. You're really going to need them to build an, a competitive advantage as you look forward. Thank you. Fantastic, Julie. Um, uh, you know, we're going to go through just a few more slides of material, but what I would ask the audience is, Julie has gone through uh, some really great material, and it's a, a rare opportunity to have the, you know, the ability to, to submit questions to an expert like, uh, like Julie. So please fire off your, your questions into the, the chat pod while we're going over the next couple of slides, and then uh, after a few minutes, we will turn back around and, and work with Julie to, to tackle uh, the questions we have time for. So what you heard in, in, in Julie's presentation was a number of different things, and I uh, just wanted to highlight a few of the, the key themes that, that came across uh, within Julie's presentation. 
Uh, one of the things you heard was, you know, really the analytics, the metrics is really an important uh, portion of this in order to be agile and adapt to the needs of your customer. Uh, part of the issues here, right, is that, that the performance is, is, uh, is, core, is core because switching costs are low and then this really means analytics uh, around that experience and the ability to deliver the right, uh, the right, to the right need of your consumer in the right moment is, 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 is really paramount today. The second thing is um, there's really a rising tide here in terms of the consumer uh, UX expectation from performance to the micro moments, how you deliver notifications, um, adding the context, location aware aspect of this. Um, really, it is becoming hyper competitive to be able to meet the needs of these consumers. And then the third uh, point that we wanted to draw attention to from Julie's presentation was this idea, uh, idea framework in terms of how you can really focus your efforts to iterate quickly, um, to learn, adapt, and uh, deliver delightful experiences with the ability to identify, design, and engineer, and analyze. And, you know, a core component of that is the ability to draw effective insights in order to drive the next iteration, uh, your, your anal analyze phase. So we wanted to spend just a, a couple of moments, two slides here. Uh, that's in a sense where uh, criticism and lean plum come in as uh, components of the overall story here. So uh, we are components that help companies uh, deliver mobile app optimization and um, really engaging mobile experiences. So criticism is in the business of providing detailed actionable data that enables IT ops or product manager developers to, to really ma monitor and manage the, the revenue or, or business critical aspects of their mobile apps. And we do this with a, a cloud platform. Uh, it provides crash and error monitoring, and that lets you know when the apps crash on the user's device, so that goes back to kind of that core performance issue. Um, and then we also provide the capability to monitor the services, the external APIs that your, your mobile app depends on. And then we also help connect to the business metrics, so the performance of business critical workflows in the app that have uh, you know an economic impact or material impact to the business goal. So that's the criticism side, and then uh, alongside that, Lean Plum is the only fully integrated, optimized platform for mobile apps that includes this flexible notion of A/B testing, really deep analytics, and powerful marketing automation. Uh, it enables product managers and, and marketers to really unlock the full potential of apps and, and optimize similarly the engagement, the retention, the monetization. And it, 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 it helps automate personalized in-app messages, push notifications that drive customers based on their behaviors or, or triggers like exiting a geofence or getting near an iBeacon. So, the idea here that we wanted to leave you with is these two things um, are often used by companies um, together, actually. Um, so wanted to just give you, to make this a little bit concrete, where this would fit into the overall uh, theme here of delivering a, an optimized mobile experience. So uh, if there's a, uh, a very large retailer that Criticism and Lean Plum work with. Uh, in order to help optimize their mobile app experiences. So a couple use cases to give you a flavor of where we play a role in this overall theme. So um, just like on the web, you know, shopping cart abandonment is obviously a, a very key issue, right? So if you have a consumer-facing app and someone drops out before checkout, that's a really big problem. And this retailer is using Lean Plum to, to rescue those abandoned carts by sending highly personalized push notifications. And you can, they, you know, similarly do A-B testing of different messages and the timing of those messages that are sent in order to optimize their return. Uh, they also monitor the notification of opt-outs and app installs, and that, that really ensures that they're able to, uh, to ensure the messaging is not being overly aggressive. 
the net of that is that they are able to see kind of a dramatic increase of checkouts and, and they're seeing uplifts in, in excess of 40%. So that's you know, one aspect of, of this. The second is the same company um, was facing an issue with, with uptime and, and crashes with the app used by store associates in order to manage inventory and do checkouts in, in their brick and mortar stores. And that was reducing kind of the employee adoption of the apps because they were complaining about the performance. So the team had very little visibility uh, and was very reactive to these issues. So they implemented a, a mobile application performance management solution for criticism, and that gives them the ability to be very proactive and get alerted to these issues, um, whether there are crashes or slowdowns in the, the underlying dependencies of the app. And that has allowed them to really dramatically improve, improve the overall overall the performance, so the crash rates drop from, from just about 10% to under 1% and really get a handle of prioritization of their business uh, and revenue impact of those uh, critical transactions. So that was really all I wanted to mention, you know, in terms of criticism and Lean Plum's part. Um, you know, we play a, uh, we'd like to think we play a small part within the overall umbrella of all the things that Julie identified as, as trends and some of the what it means for you. Uh, what we'd like to do is close things out, take some questions. Um, so with that, um, what I'd like to do is I, I've got a, a term here, and this, Julie, the, the term creepy was used multiple times throughout this presentation. So the question here is maybe you can elaborate on, on quote unquote, what creepy means in the mobile market. Creepy is anything that disturbs your customer or makes them take a step back and think, oh, you know, I'm not comfortable with that. I think uh, too often when folks want to talk about context and relevancy, they very quickly go to targeted, targeted ads, and they're really thinking from a marketer standpoint of what can I sell. And in mobile, where it is such a personal device, that's not the place that you should lead. I know it takes more time to spend time getting to know your customer, offering utilities, getting them to trust you, and learning more and serving them better through you things like utility or even education or entertainment. But I think the, uh, the focus first and foremost on advertising is one of the triggers. <clears throat> and the second part is just anything that your customer is uncomfortable with. And I think those are things you're gonna have to test. And I think you're gonna have to test really, really simple things like whether or not to use my name in a message. So what if I do walk into a drugstore or a retail store, and what if I am standing in front of a, you know, like a makeup counter from a brand? Should you address me by name or not? Or, you know, your customer's gonna find that to be creepy, and I think that's why you've gotta use analytics and do some testing and find out where those boundaries are, and those boundaries are gonna shift over time. But I think the last thing that you wanna do is make your customers feel uncomfortable either with your intent or with what you do. Perfect. So another one, um, and uh, I, I could, could hear the concern almost in the writing here, uh, um, someone was asking, you sort of have suggested that many of the traditional um, metrics that are used on mobile are perhaps not the right ones, and, and uh, you know, this person sounds like they're using the ones you mentioned, and, and so the question is, well, what are what are the right metrics, or how do you determine those? Yeah, so the, <clears throat> excuse me, and so that's really going to also depend on like the stage at which you are. You know, we talk about moving through the different stages of maturity with mobile, and some of you just may be at a place where you're just trying to get mobile done. You're trying to check the box, drive app downloads, uh, make sure your app is working, and you know that may be your first step. Some of you may be trying to uh, enhance, you know, a physical or real-world experience with digital. And so then you need to be looking at things like uses and what people do with mobile, you know, in a store and does it drive conversions. But where we really think the potential of mobile lies is in what we call transforming customer experiences through mobile. And they don't have to be digital experiences end-to-end. -end. They could be also offline experiences. So if you're looking to improve a customer, let's say, service after a product has been purchased, you know, that's one, that's a different set of metrics. That may have to do with how many inbound calls you have, the nature of those calls, how much self-service is uh, create, you know, how much self-service happens as a result of you being proactive. 
Those may be the right kinds of business metrics if customer service is the experience that you're trying to improve. One of the examples that I give is I have a product called a whistle, which is a pedometer for my dog, and it lets me know when the battery is low. It lets me know when I need to upload data. It lets me know when something is wrong, so I have fewer bad experiences with that product because it proactively helps me have a better experience. If you're, if you're a retailer and you know that the big opportunity is to influence sales in-store and it's not m-commerce, then what you really want to do is try to measure the impact of those services in the store and to what extent they contribute to revenue by using things like loyalty cards or other things that measure uh, revenue across channels rather than just measuring mobile as a channel on its own. And don't get me wrong, engagement and time spent within an app, those are great metrics if you're monetizing content or selling advertising. If you're trying to do self-service, help people conduct transactions, then those aren't necessarily going to be the best metrics on the business side when we're trying to think about, you know, has mobile fundamentally helped us improve a customer experience or transform it? I don't know if those additional examples help. Perfect. But it's yeah. not about having a mobile strategy. It's about how mobile enables your business to be better. You know, mobile isn't a standalone thing. Perfect. Um, I'm going to ask you one. I mean, I think we both probably criticism and lean plumb hear this one a lot from our co certain customers, but there's often the, the question of the, the hybrid native thing. Uh, I'll, I'll throw it out there. You know, what's what's your your response for, for folks that are dealing with that? Uh, so I think every one of the technologies has a role to play. <clears throat> if I were to start first with web, right? The browser provides, like, great consistency of experience across a lot of devices. But what's fundamentally wrong or, like, not great, let's say, I mean, not, let me say not use the word wrong, but not great about a browser is a browser-based experiences are typically adapted or they are some, they start with the web where the needs and motivations I have are based on assumptions that I'm at home. Once I'm on a mobile device, the needs and motivations that I have are very different. And that's why we talk about the need for apps. And apps need to serve the needs and motivations that your customers have while they're on the go. And that's the big break that apps need to make from web. Um, in terms of hybrid versus uh, native, hybrid apps can be good if you're primarily serving up content, if your budget is limited, and you've got to do frequent updates on an ongoing basis, right? So they work really, really well for news companies like an ESPN or a New York Times. Um, if you're a company that, you know, needs to use context and you're conducting transactions, you need to use the technology within the phone, you need to work offline, you need to be able to streamline tasks and have them something that's super snappy, then you're going to lean more towards a native app, which is, you know, also certainly more expensive. You know, and then there's a lot of scenarios that fall in between. You know, if I'm a retailer and primarily what I have is content through a catalog, then a hybrid app may be, you know, fine. You know, if I'm conducting uh, flash sales, WTSO, use hybrid. You know, they sell one thing at a time, it works. So some of it depends on the complexity, but, you know, typically companies that have the, the bandwidth and the money and are really focused on, you know, the best user experiences lean towards native if they can do it. Perfect. Thanks, Julie. And uh, we're looking at the clock here, and I think uh, we're probably at a good point to start wrapping things up. So uh, I'd like to thank, thank you, Julie, so much for joining us today. Uh, I think hopefully everyone learns uh, a lot about the upcoming year and where where the puck is going to be. Um, so apologies again about the hiccups, but again, we really appreciate you joining us today, Julie. No, thank you very much for hosting me. It was it was fun. Thank you. And to everyone that that's joined us on the webinar, we appreciate you uh, joining us today. And uh, if you have any further questions, we you know feel free to shoot them to the two links at the bottom, either criticism or lean plum. You see both are our email address is there to get in touch with us or our web websites. And uh, we'd also, I'd like to say that we will be sending out a recording of this webinar. So for everyone that, that did register, we'll, we'll send that out. And there were some questions that we weren't able to fit in time-wise, so we'll try to close the loop with those uh, as much as possible. So again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we, we really appreciate you taking a moment out of your busy day to join us today. All right, bye-bye, everyone.